Cue and Review, celebrating 40 years of audio production, welcomes you to this week's edition of the Glasgow Times Sports Podcast, recorded from our studio in the Bishop Briggs Media Centre and by our volunteers working from home. Keep up to date with Cue and Review news via our Facebook, X, formerly known as Twitter, or Instagram, at Cue and Review, that's at sign, C-U-E, a-N-D-R-E-V-I-E-W or get in touch with us directly by emailing information at qreview.com That's I-N-F-O-R-M-A-T-I-O-N at sign C-U-E-A-N-D-R-E-V-I-E-W dot C-O-M or by calling us on 0141 772 3979. Please like and share our podcast and give us constructive feedback. Evening Times Sport April 9. Faldo says McElroy has at least another decade of Masters chances. Sir Nick Faldo believes Rory McIlroy has at least another decade of opportunities to win the Masters, despite the scar tissue from his previous attempts. McIlroy famously squandered a four-shot lead in the final round in 2011 and has recorded six top tens at Augusta National since victory in the 2014 Open left him needing a green jacket to complete a career Grand Slam. The world number two finished second behind Scotty Scheffler in 2022 thanks to a thrilling final round of 64 and his second favourite behind the same player this week after finishing third in the Texas Open on Sunday. Asked if McElroy, who will turn 35 next month, was running out of chances to win the Masters Faldo said, I disagree. The game has changed. We have brought the physical element in and we understand the physical side. It was always 30 to 35 when you were in your prime and he is still in his prime. They are so fit and trained now so he has got at least another 10 years, I would say, of being supersonically fit. I still think the problem is time's gone by. We are nearly 10 years now since his last major. That is the problem. Unfortunately, it's just going on time after time. It's not just this season. There's four or five or six years of scar tissue now of Rory coming in as favourite, playing great. He has tried his best at times. Can I reset? Can I literally forget the past? Who I am. Look how talented I am and go and play golf again. It's not that easy. Can you turn back the clock? Can you delete all the negativity that you have seen and felt? I think there is a way where he could find his stride because as we know, when he finds that stride and gets that trust, then he is phenomenal. I bet that is all he wants to do. Just set me free. To achieve that goal, Faldo believes McElroy has done the right thing by stepping down from his role on the PGA Tours policy board after almost two years of being the most prominent figure in the Tours fight with LIV Golf. But the six-time major winner remains incredulous that McElroy agreed to conduct a live walk-and-talk interview during the first round of last year's Masters an event in which he went on to miss the cut. Faldo said, I didn't like it. I thought, you're kidding me. The Masters? Sure, do that any other week. But why the Masters? I mean, that is one of the most beautiful things about the Masters. It's you and your caddy, just the two of you and the other players. That's all that's inside the ropes. And to suddenly bring people in, because that's got to be organised, hasn't it? And this sort of thing, your manager is going to say to you before, 
Will you do this? Gosh, no, you need 100% concentration. I think he's trying to put priorities into golf. You've got to look out. You have a window as an athlete, don't you? You've got tons of time once you've stopped playing your sport to go and do all your other stuff. But while you're an athlete, give it 100%. That was kind of my attitude. You know, once you get your mind into other things, business and all sorts, then it's hurting your golf. It really does. Evening Times Sport, April 9. John Ram set for Masters Defence in Return to Normality. Report by Nick Roger. I'm just back from a bucket and spade holiday in the sunshine. I just about kicked the bucket, gasping at the cost, and will probably need the spade to dig myself out of the ensuing debt. Interestingly, I have a vague recollection that I first met the woman who would become my wife in a travel agent's shop when browsing the holiday options a number of years ago. Well, I think that's where it was, because even now she keeps muttering something about me being the last resort. Anyway, it was nice to get away to recharge the few remaining batteries that still have a little dollop of oomph left in them. Slumped on a deck chair, with a knotted handkerchief on my head, I passed the time by reading some of the old golfing perils penned by the celebrated wordsmith of yore, Bernard Darwin. I have for some years earned a precarious living by writing golf articles, with as low a percentage of golf in them as possible, scribbled Bernard back in ye day. The likeness with your Tuesday columnist is quite uncanny, isn't it? I suppose I'd better start writing about some golf now. It's Masters Week, that time of the year when spring is in the air, and even golfers of unfailing wretchedness have their spirits roused and senses stirred. Of course, the conditions here in the game's cradle have been so blooming wet for so long, the idea of actually digging the clubs out and trudging around in the sodden squalor is an appalling prospect, particularly for an unashamedly fair-weather golfer like myself. Nine holes of grim, attritional toil in the saturated mulch would probably give my scythe seven iron trench foot. For some of the best amateurs in the country, meanwhile, two early showpiece occasions have already been scuppered by Mother Nature's meddling. The Craig Miller Park Open, won by Nick Faldo back in 1976, and the Battle Trophy over at Creo were both scrapped due to the venues being completely drenched. Both Parkland and Lynx courses have succumbed to the indiscriminate torrents. The way the weather is trending in this country, the golf season, will probably end up being shoehorned into a couple of half-decent weeks in August. Gazing at the long-range forecast, which tends to be as uplifting as peering into your own made-to-measure coffin, I'm always reminded of the Met musings of the great N.B. Park at a particularly grotty women's open at Turnberry during the height of a Scotland summer. You guys get a cold winter and a winter and that's it, she sighed. Sometimes it's not even that good. As for the impact the weather will have on club membership, I'm sure there will be a few folk questioning the value for money as the course closed sign takes up a prolonged residency. But that's a doom-laden column for another day. All the focus this week is on affairs at Augusta National. When things get cracking on Thursday, some 283 days will have passed since all the best players and the well-kent faces in the global game went toe-to-toe -to -toe on the same stage at the Open. In these fractured times, 
The majors stand alone as rare pillars of unity amid the schism. Over two years of conflict, instability and unseemly squabbling, the quartet of Grand Slam events have assumed even more importance. For four weeks of the golfing year, we get a bit of normality and sanity. As for the other 48 weeks, well, until we get consensus and a cohesive structure moving forward, then some observers may not give two hoots about what goes on outside these major occasions. That's not good for the game either. The Masters, though, will be good for the morale. With its timeless traditions, cherished cliches and dewy-eyed reverential nods to the past, Augustus penchant for excessive, syrupy smokes just about leaves the tarmac of Magnolia Lane sticky. The media masses, meanwhile, spend the entire week covering the thing on bended knee amid an ooing eyeing orgy of genuflecting. But we probably wouldn't have it any other way, would we? After donning the green jacket last April, John Ram slipped into the LIV liveried letterman jacket a few months later. It was a seismic switch that went far beyond a sartorial statement. Ram has played only five times since November. He may be lightly raced, but another major, not the money, will energise his motivation as he squares up to the undisputed world number one, Scotty Scheffler. The question, can Rory McIlroy complete the career Grand Slam, has become an Augusta cliché on a par with the Masters doesn't begin until the back nine on Sunday. This is McIlroy's 16th assault on a green jacket. Only Sergio Garcia, who won at the 19th attempt, played in more before finally triumphing. Will Rory's time come? Golf doesn't dish out guarantees. When it comes to Tiger Woods, there are no guarantees either. The 15-time major winner had hoped to play once a month in 2024, but he's only managed 24 holes during one aborted comeback at the Genesis Invitational. Woods has arrived at Augusta, though, and will no doubt be in a bullish mood when he addresses the media. Some things never change. When it comes to the Masters, familiarity breeds contentment. Amid golf's uneasy truce, Augusta provides a comforting haven, says Nick Roger. Evening Times Sport, April 9. PSV fans sentenced over antics outside Rangers Hotel. Report by Mark Walker. A pair of PSV Eindhoven fans have been given suspended prison sentences for letting off fireworks outside Rangers Team Hotel. Rangers were drawn against the Dutch side in the 2022 Champions League playoffs and the match was delicately poised after a 2-2 draw at Ibrox in the first leg. Two PSV fans decided to disrupt preparations for the vital tie by setting off fireworks directly outside the hotel in Eindhoven that Rangers were staying in at 2 a.m. The unnamed pair who were only described as a 26-year-old man from Heesen and a 25-year-old man from North Holland, were immediately arrested and were finally up in court in Den Bosch this week. Under Dutch law, they faced up to nine months in jail. The public prosecutor said, the reason this was so serious is because of the type of fireworks they lit single shot tubes that were connected together. Very dangerous. These improvised fireworks can go in any direction. You light it, run away, and don't know what's going to happen. 
this really does not fall into the category of just mischief. The pair were both handed suspended prison sentences of three months and uh, given 120 hours of community service. The judge commented, not only was this act very dangerous, but it was also very unsportsmanlike. The fans attempt to disrupt Rangers preparations failed miserably. The Irox side won won nothing with a goal from Antonio Cholak to qualify for the group stages. Evening Times Sport, April 9. Record viewing figures for Old Firm Clash. Report by Johnny McFarlane. Sunday's electrifying Old Firm Derby which ended in a 3-3 draw between Rangers and Celtic, set a new TV viewership record for the SPFL. The encounter, pivotal in the race for the Singe Premiership title, saw Sky Sports viewership numbers peak at 1.44 million, surpassing the previous record set in December 2019 when Rangers triumphed over Celtic with a 2-1 victory at Parkhead. With the Singe Premiership heading towards an exhilarating conclusion, Celtic currently lead by a slender margin of one point at the top of the league table, while Rangers with a game in hand are hot on their heels. Neil Doncaster, SPFL Group Chief Executive, expressed his elation at the record-breaking viewership figures. It's fantastic news to see record viewing numbers for Sunday's big match between Rangers and Celtic at Ibrox, he said. These figures demonstrate both the huge interest in this renowned fixture, as well as the increased appeal of our game across Scotland, the UK and beyond. The game itself certainly did not disappoint and was hugely exciting for all supporters who tuned in. It promises to be a really dramatic end to the season with even more big games to watch live on Sky Sports in the coming weeks and I know the SPFL will continue to deliver the drama and excitement that our league is renowned for. Gary Hughes, Sky Sports Director of Football also shared his enthusiasm for the record audience, attributing it to the compelling title race narrative that the old firm Derby encapsulated. And he said, it's great to see the excitement of the title race translate into a record audience for us at Sky Sports. It was a dramatic game and underlines the quality of the product on the pitch which we are committed to continue growing alongside our partners at the SPFL. We are looking forward to bringing fans the closing stages of the season and the final Old Firm game post-split. Report by Johnny McFarlane. Evening Times Sport, April 10. Clement condemns Old Firm missile thugs. Report by Matthew Lindsay. Philippe Clement has condemned the Rangers fans who threw missiles at Celtic players and coaching staff during the Old Firm game at Ibrox on Sunday and revealed the Govan Club are currently attempting to identify and punish the culprits. Parkhead playmaker Matt O'Reilly had a glass bottle hurled at him after he scored a penalty in the first half of the Singe Premiership match and assistant manager John Kennedy was also pelted with coins in the visitors technical area. Celtic have publicly condemned the incidents which are currently being investigated by Police Scotland as totally unacceptable and have contacted their Glasgow rivals to raise their serious concerns. Clement, whose team fought back to draw the Singe Premiership match 3-3 and keep alive their chances of moving two points clear 
at the top of the league table in their game in hand against Dundee at Dens Park did not see the missiles being thrown at the time. However, the Belgian has witnessed his own players being subjected to the same treatment at grounds around the country since he arrived in Scotland back in October and he was disappointed when he learned that it had happened. He said, I didn't see that. I hear that. I don't want that things are thrown on the pitch, not at Ibrox. We had it a few times at other pitches against us, so it is not a good thing. So the club is busy with that, to see who is doing that. It is not what we want in our club. Of course the support we received was positive, and everyone wants that and nobody wants anything else. I didn't see it, but I hear that it happened. The club is investigating this. Clement confirmed yesterday that Rangers left back Ridwan Yilmaz, who picked up an injury when he was representing Turkey during the international break last month, will not be available to face Dundee this evening if the Premiership game goes ahead as scheduled. However, he stated the defender will be out for days, not weeks. The former Genk, Club Bruges and Monaco manager admitted that he may not field some of his players against Dundee because of the condition of the Dens Park pitch. And he said, of course, I need to take that into account like I do in every game. I always take these things into account. It depends on the situation. I will see the situation tomorrow. I will see also what the people who go earlier to watch the situation say. I will know better what it is and then I will make the right decision. But I always need to take everything into account. Report by Matthew Lindsay. Evening Times Sport, April 10. Club World Cup, no new idea. As rugby looks to fill pockets again, says Martin Hannan. Just when you think there's nothing that the rugby authorities can do any more that would truly surprise you, along comes the revelation that there has been an agreement in principle between the major leagues north and south of the equator to begin a World Club Championship in 2028. When the news broke yesterday, it was greeted in many quarters as something brand new and revolutionary. But hang on, this idea has been around for years, and cynic that I am, I cannot help thinking that this is merely old mutton getting dressed as new lamb. Back in July 22, for instance, the Daily Telegraph reported, the blueprint for a new Club World Cup is understood to have been agreed with a tournament involving the top 16 sides from the northern and southern hemispheres scheduled to start in 2025. Mark McCafferty, the former chief executive of Premiership Rugby, has been pushing the idea for years and it is no secret that European professional club rugby Organisers of the Champions Cup and the Challenge Cup have been trying to get the World Club Championships going for several years now. The venture capital company CVC has also been supporting the idea as they need to get some return for the millions they have invested and World Rugby is committed to growing the game globally. Now the proponents of a World Club Championship appear to have succeeded, and 2028 will see it begin. The idea is that in June of that year, the inaugural tournament will take place somewhere in the Northern Hemisphere. All five leagues are in support of the concept, with the big breakthrough, as I understand it, being the decision of the French Rugby Union to get involved. It was reported down under yesterday, that while an agreement has yet to be finalised, the format is for a four-week knockout tournament with eight European clubs, 
six sides from Super Rugby and two teams from Japan. The competition will run every four years, reported some well-informed scribes in New Zealand and Australia. And here's the problem for Scotland's two professional clubs, Edinburgh Rugby and Glasgow Warriors. Qualification for the championship will be on merit only. There will be no guarantee of participation for any club, which will undoubtedly mean some nations will not be represented. Scotland, Wales, Italy and Argentina could completely miss out, I would fear. If it was starting this June, Warriors might have a slight chance of being involved, given they are in second place in the United Rugby Championship. But if Edinburgh perform a miracle and win the Challenge Cup, would that have guaranteed them a place in the tournament? I think not because winning the second division trophy does not put you in the top eight by right. Now, you might say that Rugby League has a World Club Championship and has done for 48 years, but the Rugby League World Club Challenge is a one-off match between the champions of the Super League and Australia's National Rugby League, NRL with Wigan Warriors the current title holders, as well as being the most successful team in the championship's history. Interestingly, the challenge became a series for three years from 2015, with the top three teams from each of the Super League and NRL battling it out, but reverted to a single match in 2018 largely because the Australian clubs were unwilling to commit to travel and risk player injuries that could affect their performance in the NRL. Football also has a World Club Championship, with Manchester City as current champions. In recent years, the FIFA organised event has become a real money spinner And that is my supposition about Rugby Union getting its World Club Championship. It's all about money, about the big clubs getting bigger, and the venture capitalists and broadcasters dictating the future of our sport. You might say they already do, and proof of that came when it was announced that the Six Nations would not become one of the crown jewels of British broadcasting and be free to air. The Tory government listened to their friends and donors, and there must now be real doubt as to whether BBC and ITV will be able to show matches live when the current deal runs out at the end of next year. Underlining his reputation as a straight talker, SRU chairman John McGuigan recently admitted that the rugby unions face a real dilemma over the future of the broadcasting of the sport. I will remind you of what he said. He said, every government in terms of the Six Nations, I can certainly think of two or three, would have that very high on their agenda about free access. We would be alongside that. So it would be a central part of the discussion about Yes, you want the best commercial deal, but you also want access. So how do you create the right balance? I don't know, but here's my long-term bet. The 2028 Club World Cup will only be shown live behind a paywall. How will that grow the game? Asks Martin Hannan. Evening Times Sport, April 10. The narrative has been unacceptable, says Martinez Loza. Report by Alison McConnell. They got there in the end, which, at this point in time, was all that mattered for Pedro Martinez Loza, the Scotland women's national manager. A Sophie Howard header just after the hour mark from an Erin Cuthbert free kick, gave Scotland their first competitive win in 18 months, 
and their first win of the European Championships campaign. The performance itself was largely in keeping with the fear that has been the fear across recent months, with large chunks of the performance turgid and insipid. Still, with scrutiny across the winless run and a sense of pressure swirling around the squad, it was a necessary victory. Said a spiky Martinez loser afterwards. We won a competitive game, didn't we? We had 70 to 30 possession of the opponent. For some journalists, that doesn't count. The narrative has been unacceptable. The players do feel that. They feel the negativity. But we are happy. They were a difficult opponent on the ball and the players showed a lot of heart. What we need here is for us all to be on the same page. We are giving the team the character and consistency. That is four points from the first two games, so we are pleased. Every game is important. It is a good day. It is a day to celebrate with Rachel Corsi, who won her 150th cap, and it is important. It is unbelievable. One cap is incredible. We know what they have faced in terms of breaking barriers and to have a dream and to progress the game. It is exceptional to win 150 caps and it is a privilege to work with her. We can give more levels, but the players are here and giving everything. Scotland controlled much of the opening exchanges, but struggled to get in behind Slovakia. Veteran forward Jane Ross forced a save from Slovakian keeper while Sam Kerr was on target with a header shortly afterwards. It was Slovakia who ended the opening period and opened the second period, looking the more dangerous, forcing a save from Lee Gibson, Claire Emsley and Jamie Lee Napier were introduced before the hour mark as Scotland looked to increase the tempo. Within minutes, Scotland got the goal they craved. Erin Cuthbert's free kick was met by the head of Howard, who gave Scotland the breakthrough with a tangible sense of relief as it hit the back of the net. There could have been more. Ross had an effort, saved, and there was a moment of caution when the visitors had the ball on the net, she, but the player was clearly offside, but that underlined the fragile nature of Scotland's lead. Ultimately, the win was all that mattered for now. Report by Alison McConnell. Evening Times Sport. April 10. I am a recovering cocaine addict and sport saved me. Report by Ava White. A recovering addict has told of how he hopes to help people kick bad habits to the curb through sport. Andrew Lowen recently started running free Thai boxing classes at the Glasgow Boxing Academy on Hamilton Street in Clydebank. The sessions run from 6pm to 8pm every Friday. The boxer explained he struggled with an addiction to cocaine for several years and he has now launched the classes to support others in their sobriety journeys. Andrew said, At the end of the week, when you get that Friday feeling, that's when people go and get stuff they shouldn't be putting into their bodies. Whereas if they come to the class, is doing something positive. You might go and get a takeaway afterwards, and it might stop you from getting a drink that weekend. If it helps add a day onto your sobriety, I'm proud of you. The classes are open to everybody. It's non-judgmental. I am a recovering addict. I've been sober for about nine months now. When I'm in the class and I'm struggling, I'll lean on others. And when others are struggling, they can lean on me. That's what I'm here for. 
we can get rid of our bad habits together and we can kick them to the curb. I have been boxing for more than 20 years and I was still coming down to the gym and still coaching when I was unwell and nobody knew. I kept it to myself until it got really bad. Sport saved my life. I turned to training and it got me sober. The Dalmuir resident told the Glasgow Times he had previously been sober for around six to seven years, but had relapsed. Andrew said his mental health suffered majorly during this time, and he was left feeling suicidal. However, his life was completely turned around with the birth of his daughter in December last year, and he added, my sister had a heart to heart with me after a couple of failed suicide attempts and said, one of these times you're going to do it and you'll not be here. I went to a mental health facility and learned that the reason I used to get caught out was because I thought I'd beaten my addiction. Whereas now I know it's an ongoing battle, you're always going to be fighting for your sobriety. I'd been feeling suicidal, and then my daughter was born in December, and it opened my eyes. I thought, I'm a dad now, and I need to be with my daughter, be a good role model for her, and the only way I can do that is if I'm sober. My daughter is a big driving force for me. Andrew first started boxing at the age of seven and has trained at Drumchapel Amateur Boxing Club, the Argo, Glasgow Boxing Academy in Partick, and now Clyde Bank. The 35-year-old, who is a coach at the academy, spends much of his time at the gym and says that boxing is his way of helping people after the sport saved his life. He added, if I can support even one person feeling the way I felt, then I'll be happy. Sport is so good for people's mental health. When you go to the gym, the endorphins hit straight away and you just feel better about everything. More people are coming on a Friday night. It's good fun and everybody can come and have a good laugh as well as learn. You might want to lose some weight. Or you might want to just get out of the house. But who knows, you could end up becoming a world champion. Report by Ava White Evening Times Sport, April 11 Saudi money could price Celtic out of top transfer target. Report by Mark Walker Celtic could be set to be priced out of the market after Saudi Arabian money bags Al Ali inquired about Turkish number one keeper Yuga Khan Kakic. The trans on sport shortstopper has been linked with a 7.5 million pound move to Celtic this summer with the hoops looking for a replacement for former England keeper Joe Hart. However, it was reported that Trabzonspor are looking to closer for £12 million for the 28-year-old keeper who has won 27 international caps and has been with his club for 10 years. Now Jeddah Giants Al Ali have entered the race and would have no problem finding the money to meet the asking price. Kakir has previously been linked to clubs in Europe with Bordeaux interested last year but has remained in Turkey with Trabzonspor. But he's decided to move away from the troubled world of Turkish football with a fan attempting to challenge him on the pitch last week during a game. Al Ali's German boss, Matthias Jezel, is an admirer of Kakir and would make his move this summer with money little object to the Arabian club. Evening Times Sport, April 11. Dundee Secretary blames climate change for pitch farce. 
Report by Johnny McFarlane. Dundee Club Secretary Eric Drysdale has blamed climate change for the problems his club is facing with their pitch. Last night's match with Rangers was postponed for a second time, the fifth match at Dens Park to face the Axe this season. The SPFL have opened disciplinary proceedings against the Tayside Club, while Rangers released a stinging statement criticising the situation. But Drysdale points to the significantly higher rainfall this year as a mitigating factor. And he said, I can understand people are annoyed at this and are looking at it as Dundee's fault. What I would say is that from the research we have done in the last few days, this year's rainfall is 35% higher than the 10 year average. That shows the effects of climate change on it and it shows the work we have to do urgently on the Dens Park pitch. Asked if the pitch is not up to standard, Drysdale defended the quality of the surface and pointed again to the extreme nature of the weather faced this season. And he added, the pitch is of a very good quality, but there have been a number of occasions when home fixtures have corresponded with bad weather, such as the storms last October, which was the highest rainfall ever recorded in Scotland, and on the back of Storm Babette between Christmas and New Year, when we had the fixture with St Johnson. It is very clear that what needs to be done to rectify the situation, and we absolutely recognise the challenges we face, and the club will do what is needed. Report by Johnny McFarlane Evening Times Sport, April 11 The amount Dundee could be fined by the SPFL Report by Ewan Payton The amount that Dundee are likely to be fined if found guilty of breaching SPFL rules can be revealed. Yesterday was the fifth time the club has had a game postponed at Dens Park due to the poor condition of the pitch. Referee Don Robertson conducted two pitch inspections on Wednesday ahead of Dundee's scheduled Premiership game with Rangers, a match that had already been called off once. However, the Scottish FA official deemed the surface to be waterlogged at 3.30pm yesterday afternoon and the game was called off. It will now be played next Wednesday on April 17 with an 8pm kickoff in the City of Discovery. Rangers slammed Dundee for their negligence and unprofessionalism in failing to get the game played and the SPFL confirmed the Dens Club is under investigation over disciplinary matters. Due to a precedent set in 2010 with Motherwell, it seems likely that Dundee will be fined at least £50,000 should they be found guilty over the handling of their playing suffers by the league's governing body. The third part side were slapped with a fine of £50,000 over the horrendous condition of their pitch 14 years ago. There was some leniency provided to the steel men though, as the league recognised that they had invested heavily in a new undersoil heating system and pitch in order to try to improve it, and so £45,000 of the fine was suspended. Dundee do not have that same luxury in terms of the level of investment they put into their playing surface this season although social media posts have emerged to show that the pitch was indeed new for this season. It seems highly likely they will face at least a £50,000 fine, but it could potentially be higher due to inflation and differing circumstances. Report by Ewan Payton Evening Times Sport, April 11 Lawrence Shankland on that Scotland miss. Report by Graeme McGarry. 
having felt as though his career was going nowhere as he struggled to make an impact at Greenock Morton, fought his way back to Captain Hearts, become the top marksman in Scotland and represent his country, it is going to take more than a missed chance to keep Lawrence Shanklin down. That's not to say the striker, who prides himself on his clinical finishing, is not still smarting a little from the gilt-edged opportunity he blew while wearing the dark blue of his nation against the Netherlands a couple of weeks back in Amsterdam. For many commentators, that felt not only like a missed chance on the night, but a missed opportunity for Shankland to really stake his claim to be Steve Clark's main man up top heading into the European Championships this summer. In the typically irrepressible style of all the best strikers though, Shankland is steadfast in his belief that another chance will come his way and if he maintains the form he has shown this season, that will undoubtedly be the case. The rise of Shanklin from that career crossroads at Capelo back in the summer of 2017 to where he is now is a credit to his ability and his application from that point on, and those are the qualities that will now help him pick himself up from his miss at the Johan Cruyff Arena and, he hopes, book his ticket for Germany. Says Shanklin, When I look back to Morton, that was probably the lowest point of my career. I was not enjoying my football at all. I was not playing well, and it was a difficult time for me. But the best thing is how much I learned from then, and that I managed to kick on. Back in those days, if you would told me I'd hit the bar in Amsterdam, playing for Scotland, I'd have taken that all day. I don't look too much into it. You probably wish for the rest of your career that that goal goes in. But that's the same with every shot I take. I move on. Listen, it was a good opportunity for me to score, but it's not the first chance I have missed, and it won't be the last. That's the life of a striker. I did everything right. It was just a wee bit higher than I wanted it to go. But I wouldn't change what I did. I would still go for the same finish. It was disappointing it didn't go in. But it's one of those things. I am sure I will miss more. But I will definitely keep putting myself in a position to miss them. The ease at which Shanklin shrugs off that miss and its potential impact on his Euro hopes comes from a confidence that he has already exhibited what he can do throughout the course of the last two seasons in particular and he will be concentrating on continuing in a similar vein over these closing weeks of the campaign for Hearts. And he said, You can't overthink it. You'd kill yourself with your thoughts. That's the worst thing you can do. Listen, it was a great chance. I'm not going to deny that. But it didn't go in, and that's life. So you move on. I've done what I've done all season, and it's got me in the squad and got me game time. So I don't see the need to change it. I will just look to keep going well for hearts. And if I do that... I give myself a good chance of being involved. What Shanklin's big moment has rather masked, rather like the late rush of goals from the Netherlands did with the Scottish performance overall, is that he actually played very well on the night. No mean feat when you consider he was up against arguably the world's best defender in Virgil van Dijk. And he hopes his display showed Clark and the rest of the country that he is no one-trick pony and that the often thankless task of leading the Scotland line is one that is well within his capabilities. And he said, I think that's why I was playing, to see if I could do the job I needed to do for the team. 
I had not really had the opportunity before, and it was a chance for me to show I can do it. I thought I did my shift really well. There were positives for me. It was obviously a big test for me, the highest level I have played at in terms of the calibre of defender. It was good to go in there and test myself, and overall, I thought my performance was decent. You know when you've played well and when you've not. And I came off the pitch thinking if that goal went in, it would probably have been the perfect night for me in terms of performance. So there were plenty of positives for me to take from it. Report by Graeme McGarry Evening Times Sport, April 12 Celtic should buy Adam Ida. Report by Ewan Payton. It would be a crying shame if Celtic did not buy Adam Ida this summer, according to Chris Sutton. The striker, who former Celtic hero Sutton feels was terribly unlucky not to be the Derby winner last weekend, has six goals in just nine games for Brendan Rodgers' side. The Republic of Ireland International has made an impressive impact on the team since his January loan arrival from Norwich City, and Sutton has declared that a £3 million offer should be enough to tempt another of his former sides into selling the 23-year-old to the Glasgow Giants. He wrote in his daily record column, It's a shame to have this pitch and VAR nonsense on the back of last weekend, where Scottish football was shown in the best possible light. The old firm game was a tremendous showcase. Then days later, it's back to the circus. It's drama we want, not chaos. Hopefully, there will be more of the former this weekend and none of the latter. The season is now at the crucial stage and there can be no slip-ups in the title race. It will be interesting to see if Celtic kick on now with the likes of Callum McGregor and Rio Hatati coming back to fitness. The one thing you noticed last weekend was the bench was much stronger than it has been. You look at the impact Adam Ida had when he came on. There's an argument he should have been introduced sooner, but he put himself about and was unlucky not to be the match winner. I thought some of the criticism of Jack Butland was harsh, as it was a tremendous finish from the Irishman for the third goal, through the defender and right down low towards the keeper's leg. If it wasn't for Rabbi Matondo's sublime equaliser, Ida would have gone down as an old firm hero. As it was, he has only added to his case for a permanent transfer this summer. That's six goals in just nine games for Ida, and only six starts, and I'm sure Norwich City fans will be wondering where it's come from. I don't. I've always said he has the ability, and sometimes it just needs a change of scenery for a player to spark into life. By all accounts, Ida was the one who really pushed for the move to Celtic, and he's really grabbed his chance. It was not easy when he came in, but he's won over a lot of supporters. There was some talk when he arrived that it would cost around £3 million to get him on a permanent deal, and if that's the figure this summer, it would be an absolute steal. Ida has shown he can bring something different to the attack. Kyogo will always be the main man when fit, but it's important to have a different option in certain games or coming off the bench. When you consider some of the cash spent on strikers at Celtic in recent years, that would be small change to land a player who still has more developing to do and plenty of potential. If Ida does the business in the remainder of the campaign, it would be a crying shame not to buy him. Report by Ewan Payton Evening Times Sport April 12 <clears throat> Rangers smash season ticket renewals ceiling in just hours. Report by Ewan Payton 
The opening day of Rangers' season ticket renewals was a roaring success, it can be revealed. The club yesterday launched its True Blue campaign to signal the start of the renewals process for fans. With Philippe Clément's side in the midst of a Premiership title fight with arch-rival Celtic, it seems to have been perfectly timed by the club to gather renewal sign-ups for the 24-25 campaign. There is also the small matter of a potential treble still at stake for the Ibrox club, with the Scottish Cup up for grabs too, having already claimed the League Cup in December. It is understood that sales on day one this year surpassed that of the last in just two and a half hours. A Rangers source said, Everyone at the club has been blown away by the phenomenal response of the fans to the first day of sales. A blurb about season tickets on the Rangers website reads, Season 23-24 has already proved to be an exhilarating season. Under the driving force of our new manager, Philippe Clément, Rangers remain in the hunt for two more trophies to end this campaign on the highest of highs. What lies ahead under our new boss is beyond exciting. He constantly references you, our true blue supporters, as one of the biggest reasons for him joining our club. And the synergy built between him, his team and you is like nothing Rangers has seen for years. He knows the importance of you. The players know the importance of you. You can be and you have been the difference. Our Ibrooks home has had yet more memorable moments this season and over the next few weeks there could be many more. Season ticket renewals for season 24-25 are open now with all season ticket holders being emailed directly by the club. For the first time, renewals will be handled through SeatGeek, our new online ticketing partner. Detailed instructions on how to register for SeatGeek will be provided to season ticket holders as part of their renewal email. As always, everyone at Rangers Football Club greatly appreciates the financial sacrifice made by supporters during these difficult times and the club cannot thank you enough for your ongoing loyalty and support. Several flexible payment methods are also available to supporters. Report by Ewan Payton Evening Times Sport, April 12 Brendan Rogers dismisses freak old firm goal talk. Report by Matthew Lindsay Brendan Rodgers has dismissed suggestions that Celtic's opening goal against Rangers at Ibrox on Sunday was a freak occurrence and hailed King of the Lost Cause, Dazen Maida, for typifying how he wants his team to approach games. The Scottish champions got off to an incredible start in the Singe Premiership match against their city rivals in Govan when they took the lead just 21 seconds after kick-off. Japanese international Maida chased down a Joe Hart punt into the host box early on and netted when an attempted James Tavernier clearance ricocheted off his shins and spun beyond Jack Butland. But Rogers, whose team stayed a point in front of their nearest challengers, who have a game in hand against Dundee at Dense Park to play, does not believe the bizarre strike was an accident. He is keen for his players not to give their opponents a second on the ball in their own half, and argued the goal was both the outcome of their high-pressing strategy as well as the energy and persistence of his winger. If he doesn't have the intent and the ambition to go and win the ball, then their fullback either goes back to the keeper with comfort or he gets turned and plays forward, he told Celtic TV. But our idea is always to attack the game, 
even when we don't have the ball. That was typified in no better way with Dazen. He is the king of the lost cause. When it looked like it was maybe gone, and he couldn't quite get there, he got there, made a great block, and gave us a great start in the game. Rogers, whose team will play Rangers at Parkhead after the top six split is made, stressed that he thought his side played superior football than their rivals at Ibrox on Sunday and insisted they had deserved to come out on top at the end of the 90 minutes. And he continued, I really enjoyed it, although we were disappointed not to win because I thought we were much the better team up until their penalty. We were the team that played the football, were controlled, and some of our play in the first half was outstanding while dealing with the long ball that they play. So through to half time and the beginning of the second half, we were excellent in the game. You expect something from Rangers being at home, and I thought they got a bit of a leg up with the penalty. Report by Matthew Lindsay. Evening Times Sport, April 12. Scotland receive a coefficient blow to lose automatic Champions League slot. Report by Stuart Wilson. The Scottish Premiership will no longer have an automatic Champions League group stage place from next season after being leapfrogged by the Czech Republic in the coefficient rankings. Thanks to some strong performances, the champions of the top flight have been guaranteed a place in the past three seasons. While Celtic or Rangers will still have that prize on offer for securing this season's title, a result in the Europa Conference League quarterfinals has seen that taken away starting from the next campaign. Victoria Pilsen kept their seventh consecutive clean sheet in the competition to draw not not with Fiorentina, meaning that the Czech Republic has climbed above Scotland into 10th place. Teams are awarded two points for a win and one for a draw, with the country coefficient calculated on the cumulative performance of the teams it entered into European competition at the start of the season. The ranking is done on a five-year average. With all Scottish teams already eliminated, Pilsen had to lose both legs of their tie for the Premiership to retain its spot for next season and guarantee entry for the league winners to the 25-26 Champions League. However, the draw gives 0.25 to the Czech Republic, Pilsen's point divided by the four teams, Sparta Prague, Slavia Prague and Bohemians being the others, who entered European competition and pushes Scotland down to 11th. That could still see Rangers qualify automatically next season if they take the title, as long as they are league champion with the highest individual coefficient score in the qualifying rounds, and the Champions League winners have already qualified via their own domestic league. Going forward though, the Premiership faces a real battle not to fall even further down the rankings. The 2019-20 season saw the Premiership accrue 9.75 points, largely thanks to Rangers reaching the last 16 of the Europa League and Celtic the last 32. Th thanks to the five-year average, that will drop off the calculations from next season, automatically pushing the Scottish coefficient down to 16th place to start the campaign. The five clubs which enter will have to perform well to maintain or move up the ranking with the 8.5 points from 21-22 and the 7.9 built largely by Rangers run to the Europa League final to be removed from the five-year average in the subsequent campaigns. 
Report by Stuart Wilson. Evening Times Sport, April 12. The Champions League silver lining for Rangers and Celtic. Report by Ewan Payton. It's not all bad news for Rangers and Celtic on the European front. While the Premiership losing its automatic Champions League spot last night was undoubtedly a bitter blow to Glasgow's Big Two, it does perhaps seem there is a silver lining to be had. Victoria Pilsen's draw with Fiorentina in the Europa Conference League saw Scotland slip down to 11th in UEFA's coefficient rankings. The Czech Republic now holds that coveted 10th position that will see the champions of their top flight automatically secure passage to the Champions League group stages, not next season, but from the 25-26 campaign. Whoever wins the Premiership this season will be in the New Look Champions League next term, but it's thereafter that the problem lies for the title holders in Scotland. Well, it could be fine for Rangers if they win the league next season due to their individual club coefficient points. However, that depends on the UCL winners qualifying again through their domestic performance. For the Hoops though, last night's developments were particularly bad news as they will face the playoff no matter what should the win in the 2024 Premiership crown. But it's time to look on the bright side of life on this rather dull Friday. While on the face of things it is disappointing, playing more games in qualifying and or the Euro League will present both Rangers and Celtic with the chance to boost Scotland's coefficient again back to top 10 standards. Scotland's coefficient explained on social media, exactly if the champions have to play a qualifying round to make it, then that earns some more coefficient points for Scotland's total. It will be three rounds for the runners up instead of two. So again, another couple of games to earn points. The real silver lining is probably the Europa League though. If either team competes in that, they are likely to earn more points than they've achieved in the Champions League recently. Report by Ewan Payton. Evening Times Sport, April 12. Reason why Dundee vs Rangers was not played before Celtic clash. Report by Ewan Payton. The reason why Dundee's match against Rangers was not played last week has been revealed. The match, which was originally rescheduled for Wednesday, April 10, was postponed for a second time after the Dens Park pitch failed an inspection. Referee Don Robertson initially deemed the surface to be playable in the morning. However, after heavy rainfall in the city of Discovery, it soon became apparent that the conditions were unsafe for players, and so the match was called off again. The Premiership encounter will take place next week on Wednesday, April 17, with an 8pm kickoff, and it will be moved by the SPFL to a neutral venue should Dens not be deemed fit for purpose of the match. With all the latest developments emerging, question marks have been raised about why the match was not played midweek on Wednesday, April 3, prior to Dundee's match against Muddle and Rangers' derby encounter with Celtic. It is now understood that both clubs simply agreed to play the game this week and not last. It was suggested by Dundee that allowing for an extra week would give them a better chance to ready their playing surface. It is reported that the club told the SPFL that their pitch would not be playable on either April 2 or 3. Three alternative venues have seemingly been picked out for the rearranged game next week, 
should Dan's part once again fall foul to the weather. Dundee are said to have asked Hibbs, St Johnston and St Mirren to name their price for hosting the game at their respective homes. Chris Sutton has also detailed why the whole debacle could be even worse for Celtic than it is for Rangers. He said, There is no escaping the fact that it is a shambles and big questions have to be answered about the state of that surface. But spare me the talk, this is only bad for Rangers. It could actually turn out worse for Celtic. I know they have the possibility of going four points clear at the top of the table and no guarantee Rangers will get this one done next midweek. But if it does take place on Wednesday and the results go Dundee's at the weekend, the pressure could be totally off them. They could already be assured of a top six place and rather than scrapping to get in, they might feel the hard work is done. Report by Ewan Payton Evening Times Sport, April 15. McGowan hopes to deliver Olympic gold. Report by Tom Harrell. Rebecca McGowan has a philosophy that she hopes will deliver Olympic gold and change the face of Taekwondo. It is called Seven Arrows. The Korean kicking sport has delivered a rich seam of recent success for Team GB. Nine medals in the last four Olympics, to be precise. But it has all been shaken up by a 21-year-old from Dumbarton, whose unique journey in the sport has shaped a revolutionary ideal, culminating in Paris 2024. McGowan admits she has always been up for a scrap, ever since asking fellow five-year-olds to wrestle her at the back of the classroom. None of them wanted to join in. I'm not too sure why, she says. Her parents saw the writing on the wall after she was signed up for Highland Dancing a few months later. I was never very graceful or any good, she remembers. To be honest, it wasn't violent enough for me. McGowan has been steeped in this idiosyncratic martial art since the age of five, when she first set foot in Caledonian Taekwondo Club to teach Michael Devine a lesson. I had a love-hate friendship when I was five or six years old with a boy who lived across the street from me, McGowan said of Devine, with whom she is still in touch. One day we would be best friends laughing and smiling, and then the next day we would be beating lumps out of each other in the street. I found out that he did the Taekwondo. I thought he'd get an edge on me, so I decided to do it and do it better than him. The self-portrait that McGowan paints is a force of nature, heard before she was seen, and gregarious in a group setting. After two Taekwondo sessions, her dad quipped that he would go and put a bet that his daughter would win the Olympics. How he must have wished that he'd done so. McGowan says, I just had a natural click with it. Most kids try loads of different sports, but I was only ever drawn to one. My initial motivation was to be better than my friends, but I just fell in love with it. The fighting aspect and all the different technical kicks, the self-defence aspect of it too. Taekwondo has always given me a lot of confidence. I got to meet a lot of people from around the world, and going into adulthood, joining the Great Britain team, and going to university, it has helped me to have the confidence to go up and talk to anyone. I think that comes from having so many different experiences at such a young age. That self-belief fed twin towering ambitions to become an Olympic champion or a brain surgeon. And she understates, I like a bit of a challenge. If I'm going to do something, I want to be the best at it and to the best I can do. 
McGowan's parents diplomatically informed her that she couldn't do both, enrolling her for GB Taekwondo's Fighting Chance Talent Program when she was 14. Family girl McGowan, who would spend every moment of summer holidays with her grandmother, found leaving home for a training base in Manchester at 16 tough going. The walls of the National Take Wondo Centre in East Manchester are adorned with a gallery of legends. Sarah Stevenson, who got the ball rolling with bronze in Beijing, two time Olympic champion Jade Jones, and her best friend Bianca Cook, nee Walkden, who has dominated the women's heavyweight division for a decade. McGowan suddenly found herself in the most exalted company. And she admits, When I first moved to Manchester, I went through a little phase of not knowing who I was. The team had a certain style of doing things, and one that's working. As an athlete, you want to fit into that, but I didn't know what my own style was, and what I was contributing. You only get so far trying to be someone else. You have your own skills for a reason, your little niches, unique way of doing things and fighting. There's a winning formula, but it's about how you implement that to be the best version of yourself you can be. McGowan is one of over 1,000 elite athletes on UK Sports National Lottery funded world class programme, allowing them to train full time have access to the world's best coaches and benefit from pioneering medical support. This is vital for their pathway to the Paris 2024 Games. McGowan's path from cadet to senior level, converting world junior bronze to an equivalent senior silver, looks to the naked eye like smooth sailing. But she had ankle surgery as a junior athlete and tore her anterior cruciate ligament just after joining the GB setup in 2019. The injury that upturned her perspective, however, was a hip concern that requires surgery three years ago. Hip pain will trouble her for the first time of her life. It was into that context that Seven Arrows a powerful minimalist approach to training and competition, was born. She says, I've had to learn how to manage the pain. It's given me a whole new mindset towards training, competing, everything. I'm not able to train the other way people do. I'm only allowed to kick so many days a week, so I make sure to do what is productive for me, rather than trying to keep up with everyone. I was doing sessions at not even 80% of my capability. Now I always talk about having seven arrows. We have seven arrows and we try to make each one of them count. Heavyweights tend to like a slower pace of game. I'm different because I'm a lot more explosive and faster than other people. I learned the basics at such a young age and I can do things that the other heavyweight girls cannot. I have different weapons, and that's my X factor. I don't have the longest legs in the division, but I've got really good distance management. I can time things really well, and I use that to my advantage. I think I fight more like a boy than any of the other girls. There have been a lot of setbacks and trying to just keep on going and doing what I can do. One of my old teammates used to tell me to trust the process, and that's what I've done. Seven Arrows has delivered a stunning run of podium finishes at majors. McGowan has put herself in pole position to put Cook to the single Olympic heavyweight spot, with World Championship bronze in 22 and silver in 23, added to a European title in 21, and continental bronze in Manchester a year later. Selection to Team GB 
is not as straightforward as it might seem, with Cook having undergone surgery in both knees, meaning she was not at 100% at a crucial selection event in Manchester in December. But purely based on results, McGowan has a very strong case. And she said, I just focus on myself and doing what I need to do. It's one of the things I'm most proud of. There can be a lot of white noise in the background, with there being a legacy behind. But I did what I wanted to do, getting the medals I needed to get to be in a very good position in making sure I'm the one to go. Being able to get that experience in Tokyo gave me a fire in my belly that I've never had before. I'd done almost the entire prep and not being able to do that final part, I wasn't going to do it again for this one. I was making sure I was going to be the one that was fighting there. Studying physiotherapy at the University of Salford gives McGowan a healthy injection of perspective when it comes to the vagaries of Olympic selection. And she said, A lot of people think it would be stressful to have that on the side, but it takes me out of the bubble to spend time with normal people who are not kicking each other in the head all day. A few of the people I study with work in intensive care. We're in a high-intensity environment, but we're not dealing with people's lives. That brings you back to reality. National lottery players raise more than £30 million a week for good causes, including vital funding into sport, from grassroots to elite. Report by Tom Harrell Evening Times Sport, April 15 The St Mirren player who is as bright off the park as he is on it. Report by Ewan Payton Caelan Boyd Munns is a bright spark on the pitch for St Mirren and it seems the 24-year-old is just as bright off the pitch with a Masters in the offing for the Buddies midfielder having just completed a law degree last year. The Northern Ireland International extended his contract at the SMISA Stadium just last week, with Stephen Robinson holding onto the impressive all-round midfielder until the summer of 2025. The boss took a punt on the player a little over a year ago, in March 2023, after he was released by Middlesbrough. Such has been his brilliant form across his 30 first team appearances for the Premiership's current fifth place side, Boyd Munns was fully deserving of his contract extension. He insists it is as important for him to be focused off the field as it is to be while he plays and trains. Having grown up suffocated by football in his younger days at Birmingham City, he feels it is essential to be future-proof. Not for me personally, no, he said, when asked if the prospect of Europe kept him in Paisley. I've had a tough run of it. I've been at big clubs and I've worked my socks off and sacrificed a lot. So I was never going to be comfortable at being at a big club and not playing. Coming here, they've given me the platform and I've enjoyed it. So it was never in my mind, if we don't get Europe, then I'm not staying. I'm happy here, I'm playing football and I'm settled. So in my mind, it was never about that. Going forward, I think we'll attract bigger players. It's more of a squad in Europe. So I think to an extent. I graduated in September. I really enjoyed it. I'll see what I do next. I'm not sure what yet though. I'm going to do a master's in some sort of field. I don't know if it will be in the law again or business or something sporty. I think it's helped me 
Some people would think it's a grind, whereas I like to be focused on something else. Moving away when I was young, I was just suffocated by football, because everything is football, football, football. Even when I came home as a youngster, I'd stick on FIFA, and then everything still is football. Having something like that is a pressure for me in a different way, which I think has helped me. Boyd Munz was one of a few standouts for St Myrne, as they gave it a proper go in the first half, certainly, against Celtic on Saturday. Rio Hatati's goal shortly after the break put paid to their efforts, but the midfielder insists the way he and his teammates were able to express themselves on an open pitch was a joy. With the top six football achieved, for a second successive season, the aim is to now finish in a spot that will see the club play in European qualifiers this summer. Fifth place, ultimately, might be enough to see them over the line, so long as Aberdeen do not like the Scottish Cup on May 25. But typical of the character of the St Myrne side, Boyd Munns insists the club's sights are firmly fixed on Kilmarnock, who boast an eight-point advantage over their rivals. And he said, I enjoyed the first half. We went in at half-time and we felt really relaxed. We were comfortable and calm. We were passing it a bit. We were getting on the ball. Then we had some changes with Bewom Ono and Scott Tanzer coming off. Jaden Brown came on at half-time and he really grew into the game. He's still used to the game up here. We knew Celtic were going to come flying out of the blocks, so it was tough to take. The second one was a sucker punch for us. It's some pitch, it's nice to pass the ball on, especially with the way some of the pitches have been. It was enjoyable, and I feel we've earned that right to enjoy games. We've had a really good season, finishing in the top six, and we're enjoying playing football rather than just being in games or being territorial. Our aim is to catch fourth. That's got to be our aim. You cannot look behind. We have to look at what's in front. In these last three weeks, we've been thinking, can we achieve fourth? And all of us believe we can. We don't see why not. This Kilmarnock game was a bit of a sucker punch. We were doing so well in the first half, but I don't see why we can't get that fourth place. Pressure comes from all football. We're going to have pressure on ourselves. Pressure does not necessarily come from the outside. I think most of it comes from the inside and what we expect. If we were thinking, oh, we're happy to settle for six, then we just coast through it. Like Saturday, we'd have just coasted through the first half, but that's not the way we're thinking. We're thinking, what can we get out of it for the club? It's such a small, close-knit, community-based club. So what can we do for ourselves rather than everyone else? Report by Ewan Payton. That concludes this week's edition of the Glasgow Times Sports Podcast. Please remember to subscribe to our channels, at Q&Review, and to tell your friends about our service, 